Hello again. In a previous video we covered an unboxing and out of the box review of the Skywatcher Quattro 10CF telescope. Now once I've got this new telescope I do want to do some little modifications and tweaks to it just to get the performance out of it that I like. Uh, you know some of it's just sort of personal preference and everything and I'm going to put all these tweaks into one video just in se in separate sections. Some of them are very very easy, some of them may be a little bit more technical but hopefully you'll get some benefit out of it and let's get started. Right we've now got the scope in the mount it just makes everything a little bit easier for moving around and, and looking at the various bits and pieces and we're going to start off with a very very simple mod that I think is absolutely indispensable and that's at the focuser end so we'll just have a close up of that. The first thing you may notice is that I have this in place. Now we've introduced this in previous videos. It's the Orion Precision Centering Adapter. And you just basically put your eyepiece in and turn it to tighten. Uh, if you completely unscrew this, it's got a T uh, thread adapter just on the inside so you can fit a camera there if you want. And I just find them very, very useful. Uh, you don't have to buy the Orion one. There's another one that's made by Antares. They're both actually exactly the same. They're just rebadged. Uh, but my main reason for coming over to the focuser is for this, which is the Skywatcher Auto Focuser. Um, we'll just put that in there to help you to be able to see a little bit better because it's, it's a bit camouflaged in there. Um, now, the Auto Focuser has been out for quite a long time and I know that people now with newer Skywatcher telescopes, quite a lot of people inquire as to whether it will fit this motor system. Uh, the good news is, yes it does. I just had to cut the existing bracket a little bit um, and just slightly bend it uh, to be able to make it fit but it, it fits perfectly um, and I have to say that this is, is just one addition to my scopes that nowadays I, I couldn't lose it, it'd be like losing my right arm. Uh, they're just an absolute godsend and a very, very worthwhile investment. And if you've never seen one in operation, you basically have a handset with a speed control of it and two buttons for in and out. Uh, I've got mine actually converted for USB use under normal circumstances, but we'll just show it in action. Now that is in the fast mode, like so. And then right down to slow, like so. And it is just an absolute godsend of a piece of kit. I would strongly recommend, you know, if you're, if you're serious about your telescopes, just get yourself one of these because they are absolutely brilliant. Right, if we shine a torch down the aperture of the tube, you, the first thing that you may notice is the baffles. Now, the baffles are there to stop reflections from bouncing about within the tube and, and it's supposed to apparently just help the contrast uh, that little bit better uh, by stopping that stray light from bouncing about inside your scope tube. Now the first question some people might ask is does that reduce diameter in there caused by the baffles actually reduce the strength of the visual view of the telescope and the short answer is no um, because if you remember previously we said that a Newtonian telescope works off a parabolic mirror, that main mirror, the great big mirror down there at the end, which we'll just sort of pan round to, like so, is actually what we call a parabolic mirror, and the light reflected from that comes from that mirror in a cone shape, so in effect triangular, coming to a point where the secondary mirror is, so it actually avoids those baffles. Now the idea is that if you were looking through your telescope and you, you know, in your garden or, or something similar and let's just say that one of your neighbours turns on uh, the bathroom light, you can see all of a sudden you're starting to get some illumination inside your telescope and it doesn't stop there because that illumination then hits one of your windows and gets reflected back and it reflects off a metal ornament in your garden or another neighbour as a security light comes on and eventually you've got light flying in all over the place in your telescope. Obviously it's, it's very much uh, exaggerated by me using the torch, but you can understand that you've now got all these different light sources that are being picked up by your scope. Now if you look inside your scope, it's made as non-reflective as possible to try and prevent that. Uh, the baffles again are there to, to sort of dissipate that light if you like, stop it from bouncing about and doing any damage. It's a little bit like the Stealth Fighter, where the Stealth Fighter has a, a lot of angles built into the aircraft to try and stop radar from giving a, a, 
a, an echo back from the from the surface of the aeroplane. It's just very similar, uh, but instead of radar, we use, it's using light waves to to do the same thing. But what you may notice if we look in there is the paint isn't particularly a flat black. It's you know it's still got a little bit of reflection in there. Uh, also, we've got such as the bolts that hold the spider in place that are a little bit reflective. We've got the back of the secondary and the edges of the secondary that are also slightly reflective and you can go to the extreme and say that you've got these little bolts in there that also are a little bit reflective. Now if I wind the focuser into the tube any day now you can see that that is also reflective. So what we want to try and do is cut down as much of that reflectivity inside the tube as possible. Now the first thing that you can do to prevent that, uh, we're just going to move out and, and just increase the angle a little bit to show you. Another very very simple mod that is actually a dual purpose mod and, and is definitely of a benefit uh, for you to do and that's to make yourself one of these. Now this is a small version just for the sake of me being able to handle it in front of the, the camera. This was one that I actually made for uh, a 200p. It's actually neoprene, it's the same stuff that they make diving suits out of and I've basically got the shape cut and I then have a velcro strip on each end that you then can put together to make a tube like so. Now like I said this one is for the 200p. Now I do have one for the Quattro which is here and that simply slots with a little bit of work onto the end of the scope like so. Now what does that do? Well the first thing is it helps to prevent some of that light, that, that sort of stray light from, from getting in there because you've moved everything so much farther away um, and the neoprene being non-reflective again anything that's hitting it should be absorbed by the material and, and not actually make its way down your tube in the first place. But the other thing is that it also is what we call a dew shield. It, it will, will try and stop your mirrors from dewing up in the night, uh, especially on the, you know, these cold winter sessions that you're on, uh, and you get this dew build up on your mirrors that will blur your image and everything. Hopefully this prevents some of that because it, it, it absorbs some of the moisture out of the air before it actually manages to get down your tube in the first place. So a little bit of a dual purpose on that. Now if you want to make one of these yourself, normally it's recommended that the length is about one and a half times the diameter of your telescope. So for the so for the 200p, uh, which is 200, you would normally make it sort of 300 long. Now this being what we call an astrograph, um, and it being a very fast scope, it's actually a shorter length tube. So what I've done is I've actually made this almost twice the aperture. It's, it's, this is a, a 10 inch scope, and I've made this at 19 inches. Um, you know, the, the material is, is stiff enough to still keep its shape and everything once it's on and it just will do a that slightly better job for me I think. Next, let's move back in close up again, back to the inside. Right, another thing that we can do to prevent those stray reflections is to do what we call flocking. Now this is flocking. Um, this is the material that we use for flocking. Now this actual material is made by a company called Protostar. It's a purpose made flock material and it is intended for telescope use. Now in the UK you can't really get hold of this at the moment, it's very difficult to get hold of. Uh, so normally you have to buy it from the USA. Uh, it costs possibly about £12 a sheet for, for this, this flocking material, this protostar. Now the thing is that for an 8 inch scope, if you wanted to flock the complete scope, which obviously doesn't have the baffles, it will take two sheets. So it's not a major outlay to, to sort of do. Uh, it can be a little bit of a struggle and it does need two people to actually do the flocking process. Um, but one thing that I will say, and I've, these, this is sort of arguments that I've seen on the internet all over the place, is people saying, well, will this material work? I've seen it in the DIY shop and it's only £2.50 a sheet. And is it the same? And 
arguing over over basically you know a few pounds at the end of the day you've got a thousand pound telescope or a 500 pound telescope and you're arguing about 20 pounds as to whether it's suitable to put in your telescope or not um, you know, I mean, this stuff, it doesn't shed the fibres, so you're not going to get any little bits of black onto your mirrors and stuff. It's purpose made, you know, it's, it, it's just the right stuff to use. Now, what you would do is, this is a self-adhesive version, and you would normally stick it inside your scope. Now, on this camera, it actually doesn't look as if it's making a great deal of difference just because of the line and the sensitivity of this camcorder. But I do have a couple of pictures that show before and after uh, flocking a 300mm Newtonian, which is what I'm going to show you next. Right, once we've got our flocking sort of in position and, and just imagine that we've flocked the, the inside of the tube, we still have such as the back of the mirror, the edges of the mirror and the tips of the bolts that come into the tube and the focuser tube itself to deal with. We're also going to cover how to deal with that. Um, so what we're going to do next is we're going to have to take everything out of the out of the scope and take it to pieces basically, which means that we'll be removing uh, the secondary and spider and we'll be removing the focuser. Uh, if you were using a standard newt where you don't have the baffles and you and you you flock in the whole interior of the tube, you would also have to remove your primary as well, um, just so that you can get access from both ends really. And so that's what we're going to do next. Okay, we've now got the tube on the kitchen table. Uh, under normal circumstances, I'd be outside in the shed, but it's the middle of winter in the UK, and the snow outside is absolutely freezing. So the first thing that we're gonna do is to remove the spider and the secondary mirror, and that's really easy. It's just a matter of unscrewing all four of these retaining bolts. Now, it's worth bearing in mind that when you're doing a job like this, keep the telescope in a horizontal position. Don't be tempted to have it stood up in a vertical position and then start messing about with tools and everything because if you drop a tool down the tube, it's gonna hit your primary mirror and you're really not gonna be happy about that if that happens to you. So, once we've removed all four of these bolts, We now have, with just a little manipulation of the secondary, will come out. Like so. And there we have the absolutely huge secondary mirror for the, the quattro and the whole assembly for the spider and everything. We then pull that off somewhere safe and just put it in a very, very safe place. Just keep it somewhere safe because you definitely don't want any damage happening to that. Right, the next thing that we're going to remove is the focuser, which is on this is just simply four screws. Uh, actually nuts and bolts so just put your hand on the inside and support the nut as you start to unscrew everything now as you can see we've hit a snag there where I can't actually get the screwdriver in to remove the two screws uh, that on the rest of holding the focus are in. So what we're going to have to do next is to remove this assembly. But that's no big deal, we just need an Allen key for that one. Right, these four screws are actually the same screws that you would have to remove if you want to fix the motor focuser to your focuser on this scope. Um, so these will not look the same as they will do on a stock Quattro 
because I've actually replaced with stainless steel longer bolts to, to incorporate the bracket. So once we've got those out, at this point, as you're starting to loosen these off, just hold on to your focuser tube and just allow it to move to the bottom extent of its travel. Otherwise, when you do slacken these off, it will just drop down. You really don't want to have any sort of banging going on with anything and just that you might sort of upset any of the intricacies of the piece of kit. So, once we remove the fourth bolt, you'll see this is the actual part of the mechanism for the Crayford focuser and at this point you can see that it's, it's symmetrical which is why if I'd kept it the, the standard way this motor would start to get in the way a little bit and it just swapped over and, and just worked better that way really. So once we've got that out of the way, final two screws. Right, at that the focuser will now just lift off. Now, what I will show you at this point, with this focuser, the Skywatcher focuser, if you look, you can see that we've got some bolts here. There's some sort of tiny uh, Allen grub screws there, and there's three of them. These are for actually collimating the, the focuser itself, which is something that we're going to cover a little bit later on, after we've uh, applied the flocking to, to the tube and just done a couple of other little bits and pieces when we, we come to actually put it all back together again. Uh, for anybody who's interested um, in the actual focuser with the quattros and the fact that it is quite a bit more beefed up you can see that even they've, they've put sort of a raised steel plate now um, instead of it just being a flattened area of the aluminium of the focuser tube um, so it is just quite a bit more beefed up if you look inside there you may see the ball bearings that are supporting the tube as well as there's looks like there's some sort of adjustment there I don't know whether they're actually taking the whole thing to pieces uh, which will come but there's, there's obviously there's a stop a uh, little stop bolt there that's that's stopping the tube from actually coming all the way out which it normally does do on um, on Skywatcher focuses so we just put all this off to one side and the next thing we need to remove is if we just twist the tube around a little bit Like so, you can see, if we position it a little bit better, stop it rolling about, we've got the bracket that's for the finder. Now, if we have a look inside the tube, there's actually a steel plate at the back of this, which I'll just move around and give you a look at. Okay, with the help of the torch, you can see there's the steel plate, and that is on the back of your finder bracket there so as you remove that it might just be a good idea to keep one hand inside the tube again and uh, and support all that as well so one hand inside and just unscrew these now it might be worth pointing out here that I've done this before and you might think that I'm just sort of putting nuts and bolts down um, you know in, in sort of random sort of willy-nilly if you like um, I just know exactly where they all go anyway. So, and that's what you get from not supporting the plate properly when you finish doing the screws. Right, the next thing that we're going to want to remove is the, the actual ring on the end of the tube, um, this white ring. So, you can see that that's held on by several little Phillips head bolts all the way around. So we're going to just work around the tube and, and remove all of these. Okay, this is now the last screw removed and hopefully this end should just slot out like so. Now, if you're removing the primary mirror end, it's exactly the same procedure as the screws going round. But when you pull it out, it will be very, very heavy and it contains also the primary mirror cell and, and your mirror itself is held in there with your mirror clips in fact later on in this video we'll take a look at that um, but now we're at the point where we're actually ready to just flock the inside of that tube there what I would do is give it in, inside there a clean with uh, maybe some isopropyl alcohol or similar 
Um, just number one to, to take away any any sort of residue that's there, any dust that you know you want the your, your protostar to stick well to it. Um, but also, the, if a cloth just removes any little bits of roughness sometimes that, that might be in there. So that's what we're going to do next. Just give that a wipe over. Right. Uh, with the help of a torch and just letting you look in there, you can see that I've now given it a really good cleaning with uh, a cloth that's been soaked in isopropyl alcohol. And with a carbon fibre tube, this is where we start to hit our first little problem. Under normal circumstances, I would flop the, the section of tube that I want to in one piece. Um, and then what you need to do is when you flock a tube with the protostar or any of the self-adhesive flocks, you then need to score lines down the length of the flocking. That's because due to differences in expansion and contraction, when, it, when tubes get hot and they get cold, it can cause the, the adhesive to just start to come away from the tube a little bit. So in this case, the alternative I'm going to have to have, because I don't really want to put a knife down there and start scoring the, the flocking when it's a carbon fibre tube, I'll start to damage the tube. So I'm actually going to flock that end section of the tube in strips. Okay, so we've now got the flocking fitted. As you can see, you just ignore any of the holes in the case, um, such as the focuser hole or any slot holes for bolts and everything. Just, just go over the top of those, we'll address that in a moment. Uh, I will say at this point, when you are flocking, be very, very careful and take your time with it because the adhesive on Protostar Flock is absolutely vicious. It, it's like flypaper, you know, the sort of stuff that used to hang up in old times to catch flies. Um, now what you're going to need is, I would prefer to have both a Stanley knife and a scalpel. The scalpel, especially for the finer holes, um, just because it's, it's that fine with the point, it just lets you get into those finer holes a little bit better. Uh, and the Stanley knife, obviously for the bigger stuff and for going around these edges. But I would also recommend that you put a new blade in your knife before you start. Because, you know, you just want everything to go as smoothly as possible. And, and just a nice fresh blade will help you keep your cuts a lot cleaner. So that's what we're going to do next and just work around these, these cuts and these edges. Like so, as I said, you just take your time. Uh, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to work around the focuser. And you can see that I've got one of the joints just that runs over the focuser. Like I said before, uh, this has actually been done in strips because I don't want to put the score marks in into the actual flocking while it's in the tube, it's much easier to just do it in strips. Obviously with a metal tube you could do it in, in sort of two full sections and then just score it afterwards. That is all covered in the instructions with Protostar when you get it and you do get an instruction sheet. So next I'm just going to cut around this focuser and cut these edges off and then we'll come back. Okay, once you've done the cutouts for your focuser and been through all the bolt holes and everything, it's a real good idea at this point to just get two fingers and put one on the inside and one on the outside and just press together on all the holes in the tube. And also where the focuser goes, just pinch together just to make sure that when you've been doing the cuts that you haven't actually just dislodged any of the of the flocking material and also do the same around the edges of the tube just work your way all the way around and just pinch together um, that way you just like I say you're making sure that it's, it's well and truly stuck on the edges once we've done that what you do next is you give your wife a heart attack because at this point you need to get out the vacuum cleaner and attach the brush attachment this one and <laughs> need to do a really good vacuuming job on the inside of where you've flocked. What you're doing there is you're taking away any little bits that you might have dropped when you've been doing your cutouts but also any stray fibres from the manufacturing process of the actual flock you're just taking those away and it also it helps to bring the, the, the life of the fibre back up again because you've been pressing and, and, and sort of you know 
putting grain into it, if you like, by, by pressing in with your fingers to make it all stick, it just lifts it all back up again, all the fibres, and you will see a difference, but it is important that you just give it a really good vacuum cleaning. Okay, now that we've done the vacuuming, uh, we're about ready to start putting parts of the scope back together again. Just before I do so, uh, I just want to show you a couple of things. The first one is that focuser tube that we saw earlier with the shiny outside. That now has been treated to a coat or two of international paint, blackboard paint. Now obviously I've masked off the areas where the burrings actually roll up and down on the focuser tube. Um, and you can sometimes, if you can get away with it, you can actually flock the inside of the focuser tube. I find on the quattro that the tolerance just isn't enough. If the thickness of the, of the actual flocking, it doesn't allow um, sort of two inch eyepieces or adapters to slide in there properly. So it is something that you want to check for. On my 200p, I did manage to flock the inside of the focuser tube and it, it works perfectly well but you do have to have very small hands or a, a family of midgets or something to help you with that one uh, also the secondary mirror now has been stealthed up the same the edges have blackened again with international paint blackboard paint and the back of it and so that is now the secondary mirror uh, also the plate that goes at the back of the finder inside the tube again I've coated it with international paint blackboard paint now sometimes on camera you can't quite see the difference but that is actually now quite a lot more sort of matte uh, sort of a flatter finish than the standard paint that came with the scope uh, in fact if I turn it over you may just be able to see a difference there it just all helps and at the end of the day it maybe it helps a lot maybe it helps a bit but it also helps with your confidence as well if you feel confident in your equipment and you've done everything that you can with it that you, you feel will make it perform to its best then you know it, it might even be psychological but you just you know feel happier working with it uh, now before we start to fit the focuser back on i'm going to show you a technique for centering your focuser what i'm going to do first of all though is just fit that focuser tube back into the focuser assembly and then we'll start showing you just how to center um, your focuser in your tube right the next thing that i'm going to show you is how to center your focuser um, into your tube so that you know that your focus is exactly square on your tube now to get these measurements the first thing that we're going to need is a piece of card. Now this card needs to be roughly um, halfway the internal circumference of your tube. It can be slightly less, it can be slightly more, it's not important and we'll sh I'll show you why in, in just a moment. So what I'm going to do, because it's a little bit dark in there and you can't see, I'm just going to take a torch and just light up the inside a little bit. Now you're going to need a pen of some sort that will actually show up on the flock. It's quite difficult to get something that will do it. This is a, a, a fine, sort of indelible fine marker that I know does show up on flock. So what we do is, it's a lot easier this if you've got something like a peg like this, um, sort of, you know, this sort of a clip or a closed peg or, or something similar. Take your piece of card and mate it up to the very edge of the hole that your focuser fits through and just clip that there. What we do next is get the card and press it against the inside edge of the, sort of the telescope tube, the inside wall and you're making sure that there aren't any loops in there or anything, it's just it's flat against that inside wall. Once we've done that and just like I said, make sure to double check it, just run your fingers up it a couple of times, just feel that it's, it's right up against that tube wall. Take your pen and just mark where that line hits, where the, where the end of the cardboard is. Just put a couple of marks in there, like so. Again, just make sure, double check. Once we've done that, do exactly the same thing on the opposite side. Again, get the cardboard, just put it right on the edge of that hole, like so, and again press against the tube wall. Oh, 
like so and again draw a line next take your cardboard again place it inside the tube again pressing down and just transfer those two marks to your piece of cardboard like so next what we do is take your piece of cardboard and a ruler and we need to just measure between those two lines and find the centre which I'm just going to go down on the table and do that right it's actually 102 millimetres so what we'll do next is just mark at 51 millimetres so we mark our card and the next thing we do is the torch on again place the card inside the tube and line up our two earlier marks that we transferred from the tube to the cardboard and now just transfer that centre mark into the tube like so and now we know that what we have is the centre that's, that's in, in this plane directly opposite the focuser so next we need to find the centre in this plane so what, how we're going to do that is we take a digital caliper like this and if you haven't got one of these they're really just worthwhile having for all sorts of things and you can actually get one for about £10 on eBay um, so what we do just make sure that it's zeroed and then we measure the diameter of the hole that the focuser fits in. Now it's important that you measure it in this plane here going across from, from sort of the front to the back of the telescope either end because a hole that's in a curved surface will give different dimensions across the curve. So we need to go this way. give a little bit of a movement and you, you get to feel exactly when you're at the right point and that is actually measuring 94.98 millimeters which for all intents and purposes is, is 95 millimeters so we write that down the 95 millimeters on a piece of paper 95 millimeters and what we do is we half our 95 millimeters so half of 95 millimeters is 47.5 so 47.5 millimeters the next thing that we do is take our digital caliper again and this time we measure from this part of the of the focus hole to the actual front of the tube again just sort of backwards and forwards a little bit just to feel that you've got exactly the right spot and that measurement is 53.52 and again just double check it an old saying from my old school days uh, from my woodwork teacher uh, metalwork as well used to be measure twice cut once and it's it's just a really good piece of advice that with something like this so I double check 53.5 so add the 53.5 onto our piece of paper 53.5 and we're now going to just add together that half of this diameter of the focuser hole with our 53.5 which gives us uh, one that gives us 11 gives us 10 which makes 101 millimeters so what we do next is we take our caliper again or you can use a steel rule and just set it 
at 110 millimeters. Now what we do is we go from the bottom end of the tube and measure that amount. Let me just tip the camera down a little bit for you. Okay, uh, this is going to get difficult trying to get light in there as well. Right, now what we do is we transfer that measurement from the front edge of the tube inwards. like so. Now our two lines that we've now made, the one caused by the cardboard and the one that we've just measured, you should get a little cross from that and I don't know if you can actually see that but obviously with the, when the cardboard was in we made a line this way and as we've just sort of gone in now we've made a line the opposite way so where those two lines cross we now know that that is exactly the opposite of the centre of this hole so next what we're going to do is use something to make that a, a, almost a permanent feature uh, in, inside the tube that's sort of in, unobtrusive but that we can again refer back to at any time we want to if we ever need to recenter our focus and that's what we're going to do next Right, what I've got here is a set of uh, the paper reinforcing rings um, that you buy from stationers and what I've done with one of them is just gone over it with a, a permanent marker and next what I'm going to do is just take that single ring and place it over the cross that I made with my pen before to mark the centre of the opposite side of the focuser. Now once I've got it into position like so, the thing is that the adhesive on these rings isn't particularly good so what I would do is take some um, what they call cyanoacrylate glue which is the same as sort of super glue but the thin sort you know you get it in, in different consistencies and I would just put a spot of that around where that ring stuck and just let it capillary under uh, and glue that ring down otherwise what you might find is that you're out, if you're out in sort of dewed up conditions and there's a lot of moisture in the air uh, the next time that you come to collimate your scope you might actually find that you've got two centre spots on your primary mirror uh, a black one and a white one so what I'm going to do next is I'm just going to put a little spot of super glue on there and next we're going to fix the focuser back on and then I will show you how to actually centre and collimate the focuser once it's in position and we're going to show you how to do that with a couple of different methods. Right, I'm going to show you the first two methods now of uh, checking whether you, your focuser is actually all square with your tube and everything and the easiest one of all is to use one of these, a laser collimator and all we do is we simply put the laser collimator into the focuser and fasten it up and then switch on. Now I've got my torch here because I'm trying to illuminate um, that ring binder reinforcement that we fixed earlier uh, which is just there and you can see that it is actually out. Um, the laser put should now actually be pointing right in the centre of that little ring. Um, and I know that my laser collimator is actually collimated and it's something that's been covered in a previous video. Uh, another th way that you can do it is you can use one of these if you have one of these which is uh, what we call a Cheshire or a Cheshire combination collimating eyepiece. And again you can put that into the focuser and tighten up. But what you need to do is to shine a torch into the tube when you actually look down that collimator and these collimators do have a crosshair running through them so again you'll be able to see that ring and you'll see the crosshairs in your in your Cheshire and that is actually agreeing with what the laser said that it is actually slightly out. Now next I'm going to show you a posher way to do it and it's just a little something that I've developed myself um, and it'll also allow me to sort of show you on camera what I'm doing as I'm doing it and that's what we're going to do next. Right, so we're just taking a break from the kitchen workshop for a minute and I just want to introduce you to this 
Now, for all intents and purposes, this actually just looks like it's a, an astronomy modified Microsoft Live Cam. Uh, the difference is with this one is that I left the, the lens intact. Uh, I don't know if you can see in there, if I can just get the right angle, there we go. You can see that the actual camera lens is still on it, which means for all intents and purposes, it still works as a normal webcam, just in, in this sort of case shape what that allows me to do is to actually put it into my telescope and, and it'll hit focus and, and just be able to look at the insides in there now if i use this in conjunction with a couple of pieces of software it actually can give you quite a, a nice little tool and i'm just going to show you that in action before we actually use it on the scope itself Right, as you can see, I've now launched SharpCap, um, which is my favourite imaging software, and it's just worked well for, for what it is that we're going to do because it, it just has a couple of little tools that are useful. Um, and it, I, we've got the camera job, so I just set out, there we go, and uh, pointing at a, a random part of the room. And as you can see, there is some vignette in, but that's not important um, you know, for what we're going to use it for. Now, the first thing that we do is launch the reticule in SharpCap and this reticule goes directly across the middle of the field of view of the camera so we know that the the cross in the reticule is the center of, of the camera's field of view now also if we add on another piece of software that's called mere decolumation and i'll give you a link for that um you know during the video i'll, I'll just post up the link for you if we launch that it actually is an overlayable reticule of a different type now if you look closely what we can do is we can just position that and center the two over the top of each other and you sort of have to look fairly closely until you get a perfect little cross with a and it, it actually makes a cross with a circle in it so that you know that you're exactly centered there now we can change the colors of the reticule in media collimation like so if we just need a little bit of difference or contrast or whatever it is that we're looking at and also we can change the sizes and the number of the circles which will actually come in handy uh, a little bit later on so next what we're going to do is uh, just use one of these pieces of software first the sharp cap on its own to um, to center the focuser uh, but also later we'll be using the made of collimation in conjunction with sharp cap to actually help with the collimation procedure uh, with the telescope so that's what we're going to do next is go back to the telescope with the camera right so as you can see we've now got the focuser with the camera fitted into there and the laptop with sharp cap running and with the reticule turned on which you may not be able to see but we'll give you a look at that uh, now that is also saying that the, it's out of centre and it's actually pointing at exactly the same spot that both the Cheshire and actually two different ways of collimators were pointing at. So we do know now that this focuser is just slightly out of alignment a little bit. So what we're going to do is align the focuser. Now, as I said before, um, this focuser, the Skywatcher focuser, is collimatable and I'm just going to show you a close-up of that because I've actually found a point where Skywatcher are going to score some minus points and we'll just give you a look at why. Okay, so as I said, the focuser has got collimation screws in it. Here's one set, which is, okay, you know, fairly accessible. And if we work our way around, we'll see that here is the other set. And then the third set, well, that is mm, under there. So, I'm sorry, Skywatcher, but I'm going to give you some minus points for that one. You actually can't get an allen key in there to, to make those adjustments without having to actually remove this assembly again um, so I think that's a point that really does need addressing I must say that I do like um, the fact that you can centre this focuser with the collimation screws but I, you know that is, is for me is a, is a minus point there um, so what we're going to do next is move back to a wider angle view and get this focuser centred up Okay, so we're actually at the wider view again. Um, something to bear in mind with the collimation screws on these. It's a lot like the, um, the collimation screws on your primary mirror. There's a tiny grub screw, uh, which is in effect is, is what pushes each, the, the focuser 
in whichever direction and then there's a bigger screw which actually is what fixes it to its, its base itself so in other words the, the small grub screw uh, sort of comes down and, and just lifts it a little bit so obviously you need to sort of slacken the larger one and then tighten or slacken the smaller one before tightening again with the bigger one um, now it may be worthwhile just bearing in mind if when you first start this job is to just slacken off the larger allen screws a little bit slacken off the small ones on all three and then re-tighten the bigger ones and then check the, whether it's in centre again you might just find that one of the, the smaller screws has, has just been screwed down a little bit too far at assembly and it's actually just that that's making it run out uh, you know, so once you've done that, you know that the actual the focus apart itself and its plate are both screwed down and, and you know tightened in with each other. Then we can start making some adjustments. And what I'm going to do with this is I'll start making adjustments and show you on the screen as it starts to come in uh, with the capture screen. Right, a slight hiccup there is uh, I discovered that when you save the, the video in Sharpcat, it actually doesn't save the image of the of the reticule. So by me saving the doing a save file in, in Sharpcat, you wouldn't actually see what it is I'm talking about with regards to the reticule. So I've actually just got the camcorder pointing at the uh, laptop screen so that you can see what's going on. And you can see the reinforcing ring there and you can see the reticule and you can see that it's, it is actually out. So what we're going to do now is once again we're going to try and centre this focuser. Right, I've now swapped over to the laser collimator and as you can see we've now got the laser spot absolutely straight in the middle of, of the, the reinforcing ring that we fitted earlier. Uh, now I do want you to bear something in mind and that is, okay, yes the focuser was slightly out of square, but at the end of the day Skywatcher are a mass produced telescope produced for a good price um, and, and a, of a standard quality that level of precision to have a focus a perfectly squared per tube because every tube don't forget and every focus will come off the line very slightly different then you'd just be asking too much so it's not something that you need to look at uh, with regard to the brand in a detrimental way it's just that you know these are the things that you can you can do yourself and, and just improve on what's already a, a perfectly good pattern Right, the next thing that we're going to deal with is probably the most scary part and that's the primary mirror. Uh, much like at the other end where we removed the ring, uh, it's the, just the screws that are going around the perimeter. So what we're going to do is I'm going to remove these and we'll come back as I've removed the, the last screw. Okay, we're now on the last screw and what you need to do is, once you've sort of just loosened the screw off, is fully support the mirror cell as you just undo that last screw because one thing you certainly don't want is an accident with this section of your scope now sometimes it may be a little bit tight sometimes it'll just ease out quite nicely and what you want to do then is just put it down on a nice flat level surface and next we're going to just clear the, the actual tube away and uh, so that we can concentrate on the mirror itself Right, now that we've got the primary mirror out and, and put in a safe place, um, you, the first thing that you notice is that it's got six clips that hold the mirror in. Now that's because this is a 10 inch, if it was an 8 inch or less, normally you will find three clips. Now on first having a look at this, you would think that these clips are actually a little bit loose because some of them do move. Uh, that's actually intentional, um, you know, don't sort of be tempted to tighten them up and thinking that you're doing yourself a favour by tightening your mirror up in itself. You should be able to fit a piece of paper between the surface of the mirror and the actual clip itself. The reason for that is if it's tight on the mirror surface we get what we call pinch errors which is, is in effect is a stress and you, you introduce a stress at that clip that will actually go across the surface of the mirror. And if you're imaging or on a, on, a, on a star, if you defocus a star, you can actually see pinch errors. It is a, a, a proper, a real phenomenon. So, you know, just bear that in mind with your clips. 
Now, one of the first things to check when you've got the primary mirror out is whether the centre spot is actually central or not, because, you know, if you've got collimation I OCD like I have, uh, then that's quite important to me. Now, if you're going to undo these clips, a couple of things to stress. The first one is make sure that you get a screwdriver that is a very, very good fit in those particular screws. Don't use one too big or too small because whatever you do, you don't want to skip out of the screw and then bounce the screwdriver tip across the face of your mirror. Uh, you know, it'll be really, really upsetting if you do that. Now also, as you do undo them, it's a good idea to get the screwdriver in position in the screw and just surround it with your fingers, like so. And that way, if there is sort of any inclination to slip out, at least your fingers are there to, to stop it. And to be honest, I'd rather cut my fingers with a screwdriver than put a scratch in the front surface of, of a primary mirror. So what we're going to do next is I'm just going to remove all these clips and take the actual cell, uh, the mirror out of the actual cell and we'll show you how to centre spot a primary or to check that the, the spot is actually central. Right, now that we've got all the clips out, the mirror itself will actually just lift out of the cell. Now be very, very careful with that mirror. As you can see, it's a very hefty piece of glass. So just place that somewhere onto one side and then this is the cell itself that actually holds the mirror um, and we're just going to put that off to one side and devote this space to the mirror itself. And the next thing that we're going to need is a piece of paper that's, that's bigger than, than the actual diameter of the mirror. So I'm just going to go off and get a piece of paper now. Right, I've now got my piece of paper, so what we need to do is just move the mirror off to one side and brush off the surface that you're going to lay the mirror onto. Like so, take your piece of paper, lay your paper down on the surface and then take your mirror and place that mirror face down onto your piece of paper like so. Next, just take a pen and draw around your mirror. Keep an eye on this while you're doing it and just make sure that your pen has actually marked the paper all the way around. That way you don't end up having to do it twice. Just go around a couple of times just to make sure that the, uh, the line's nice and clear for you. Then take off the mirror, and as you can see, that's not bloody worked. Right, once we're happy with that, we remove the mirror, carefully, and as you can see we've just got a couple of areas where it hasn't quite taken, but it's still marked on the paper. Uh, and what we're going to do next is just cut that out, so you need to just take a pair of scissors and cut it out, and we'll be back in a moment. Right, I've now got my paper circle uh, which I've cut out and it is worthwhile really taking your time to just cut that out, you know, so that it's as accurate as possible. And also I would like to stress at this point, with your primary mirror, if it's got any little marks on it or anything like that, whatever you do, do not be tempted to sort of get the glass cleaner out in a cloth and give it a polish for God's sake. Um, there's a special method of cleaning uh, telescope mirrors because they're a first surface mirror. It's completely different than the mirrors that are hung up in your house. Um, just leave it alone if you don't know what you're doing. There are tutorials on the internet about how to clean primary mirrors and secondary mirrors for telescopes and you know you can look that up. So, And you also don't want to be putting your fingers on the actual face of that mirror. Just keep well alone, handle it by the edges. Now once we've got our, our paper circle, what we do next is we fold it exactly in half and again take your time because this needs to be accurate so just check and double check that you are folding exactly in half as I said for just folding a piece of paper in half it does seem to be taking a while but you really do need to take your time with it and make sure that it's, it's exact once we fold it in half 
do exactly the same thing again and fold in half again. Again taking care. that you are folding exactly in half. Sometimes it's a good idea if you get these edges matched up like so to just get a ruler and just push it in there like so just to help the folding process a little bit. Again, take your time. Right, once we've done that, take your scissors and that bottom corner here, we just want to snip off just the slightest little amount, just a tiny, tiny snip. Like so, we'll just go in on close up on that, if you can see, it's just a tiny, tiny snip off that corner. Now, when we open up, you'll see that we now have a tiny hole right in the centre of that circle. So now, place your circle on your flat surface again, just smooth it out a little bit. Like so. Take your mirror again and your marker pen. Now, um, it's a good idea to use sort of a black felt tip or a similar, uh, preferably a water soluble one, so that when we do this after, afterwards, you can, you can just remove any mark that you make uh, with a, a, a cotton bud and just dampen very slightly and just, just very, very gently just, just smooth it back off again. Now, a good idea also is to take your marker pen before you do this and take a piece of paper and just scribble a little bit on your piece of paper with the marker pen so that you know that the, the tip of the marker isn't dry uh, otherwise you're going to be wasting your time and trying to put a spot there and it's just not going to appear because glass is an awkward sort of material to get these sorts of pens to work on anyway. Next what we do, place the disc onto the mirror like so and it work round with your fingers so that that disc is exactly lined up with the edges of the mirror if need be then you know get a closer look in so you know come down and, and just have a close look at it and again really take your time with this procedure you know if you're not happy with the exact position then do it again and do it again and do it again now sometimes a primary mirror doesn't come with a centre spot in it and you might actually want to just add a centre spot to aid in the, uh, the collimation process. Uh, and in that case the procedure is exactly the same. So, once I'm in a position where I'm happy that my piece of paper is exactly on that primary. The next thing to do is to just take your pen and just mark like so with just a little dot. Take your paper away and you'll see that my centre circle on that mirror is actually not quite central. It's actually out by about oh, maybe, maybe two or three millimetres um, which you know it will still work fine and it, it's of no detriment to the manufacturer. It's, you know it's a it's a mass-produced telescope at the, at the end of the day. Um, so how do we fix that? Well, you can either just fix a new dot into the center of the mirror. And again, um, the reinforcing stickers that you get from stationers um, are actually quite good for that, which are these things. And you can either I mean, the best thing I would recommend it as a if you you know if you're not 100% confident is to actually just put it over the top of the old one, but obviously centralised. And then once you've done that, just just sort of place it on very very gently. A pair of tweezers is a good idea, and I would push it down with a cotton bud. Don't get your fingers and start you know pressing it into uh, your mirror. And any very very tiny marks that you do make as you as you sort of add one of these. 
if they're right in the centre, it's not that important because that centre part of your mirror is actually in the shadow of your secondary mirror in your scope. So the, the centre is, is more important for collimation than actual viewing. Um, so what we're going to do next is I'm just going to double check off camera that my spot is slightly out as, as that's just illustrated and we'll come back when I come to put the fresh spot on. Right, as you can see with my mirror, I've actually removed the existing centre spot and I've re-spotted with a completely different sort of spot. This is actually called a hot spot and it's made by uh, Jim Fly who, uh, who does the cat's eye collimation equipment. And the idea is that each of the three fins of the radiation symbol actually point to one of the collimation screws on your mirror cell at the back and when you're collimating it actually just helps you a little bit because it basically points to which which collimation screw that you need to adjust so what else can we do with this primary mirror well if we look on the sides of it it's it's actually quite reflective on its edges and on the back as well um, like so so what do you think do we why not? Right, I've now stealthed the primary mirror. Uh, the back of the mirror is coated in protostar flock and the edges are painted in international paint, black void paint. So, as you can see, it's now completely stealthed. And with the help of a third hand, we can now place that back into the primary mirror cell like so. Now with regards to the mirror clips here what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace those with these which are actually the same sort of bolt but they're actually a cap head socket screw so they're a much better bolt than I'm going to fix the, the actual clips to the cell with and um, that's what I'm going to do now and we'll come back when that's done. Right, as you can see, I've now got all the mirror clips back in and as we said right at the beginning when dealing with the primary mirror, these do not get tightened up uh, as if you're, you're actually trying to fix the mirror in. They're simply a gentle method of holding the mirror into that cell and you should actually be able to slide a thin piece of paper between the surface of the mirror and the actual clip. So there should actually be a slight amount of wiggle there which is perfectly normal. Now also if we just go over to the tube itself, you can see that where the, the primary mirror section or the cell fixes into the tube, where the, the first part of the tube is before the baffles actually start, I'm also going to flock that. So I'm going to go off now and flock that part and then we'll come to actually fixing the cell back into the tube. Right, we now have our mirror cell ready to fit back into our tube. Now this being a carbon fibre tube, there is no seam in the tube, a folded seam that you would have in a steel tube. So with your mirror cell, in, if, if you fit it into a steel tube, make note of the cutouts because one of those cutouts will be where your seam fits in it's to, because the, the tube is actually, actually slightly thicker at the, at the seam and then that way your holes will line up if you've got sort of two slots for the seam one of them will be correct and your holes will actually line up uh, on your tube so orientation isn't particularly a problem um, possibly with if you've got a carbon fibre tube you might want to maybe just put a little mark on there uh, with a, a pencil or maybe just put a sticker on there and a sticker on the on the cell before you remove it so that you know you've got the orientation right but to be honest because it's a circular uh, item the tube and the and the mirror cell, I don't really see any particular problem with that. But like I say, if you've got a metal tube, then bear in mind that the cutout is where your seam actually goes. So what we're gonna do is just slot this in, and then we'll fit the screws back in again. Okay, once you've got all your screws back in again that hold the cell to the tube, at this point it might be a really good idea to sort of stand your tube on its end um, on the, the, the secondary sort of the aperture end on, on the floor and just give it a light press down all the way around before you actually tighten the screws up. All the screws are actually in there, they're still just loose at the moment. The reason being that if, you, if you've got your, your tube on its side and you start to fit the cell in, because there is some tolerance in the holes in the tube where your bolts are, you can actually screw your, your mirror cell 
into onto your tube just maybe slightly out of square so we're taking for granted that the tube itself is going to be square on the end so just give it a little press down all the way around to make sure that it's bedded in and then work around and tighten those screws up right a change of clothes because i've actually been out in the shed uh, doing a lot of drilling and banging today um, but we've got the scope on the mount now and as you probably noticed it's quite dark and I need it dark to, to demonstrate the, the next thing. Uh, as you remember we've got the primary fitted, there's still no secondary and still no spider in there. Uh, but first a question, how many of you, and I know I'm one, are guilty of sort of if you're on your own or somewhere with your scope, sort of in your garden, in an observatory or something where you're not in, in sort of a, a, an astro party situation where light levels are kept to a minimum. You sort of think to yourself, I've got my torch in my hand and my telescope's pointing that way and I, I just need to have a look over here. And you know, you, you, you've got your torch on or your, your, your laptop even and you've got your full screen going and you know, everybody does it I think. Now also, the, the forums and the internet are absolutely full of people, that are images that will post up pictures and say I've, I've got this strange reflection or I've got this strange artefact and I can't figure out what it is. Well, here's a possibility that I'm going to show you. And what we're going to do is we're going to bring the camera up to the scope aperture and I'm going to drop the lights right down and then I'm going to start moving about with the torch again. Right, I've never actually got the, the, the camcorder pushed as far down the, the aperture of the telescope as I possibly can. Uh, that image of me that you can see is, is my reflection as you were looking in the in the reflection in the primary mirror. Now the first thing that I'm going to have to do next is to put the camera into night vision mode and turn the lights down before I give you the next demonstration. Okay, there we are in night mode, uh, which means that the frame rate is quite a bit slower, but that's not important. What we're going to do next is to turn the lights off, and now I'm going to shine about with my torch up towards the back of the telescope. And with a bit of luck, you'll be able to see exactly what it is that I'm talking about. That's actually light that is bouncing around the back of the of the scope where the, the primary mirror mount is and just working its way around inside and what we're going to do in a second is I'll bring you around the back of the scope and just show you how, we, how that light's getting in there but it's something that doesn't occur to a lot of people you think that when you're at the back of your telescope that and you know there's nothing getting in there well unfortunately there is right so now we can see exactly what's happening the light is hitting these white areas uh, reflecting off them and actually some of it is working its way down in through this where there's actually a joint if you like between the rear ring and the and the primary mirror cell and it's it's just working its way around there now obviously blacking the mirror as I did do earlier uh, that's reduced it quite a bit so you can imagine what it was like previously but there is another thing that you can do to cure that and that's what I'm going to show you next Right, now this is something that we've actually covered in a previous video, so I'm not going to go to, into too much detail of it. But this is basically a, a Newtonian cooling system of, of my own design. Uh, it has a speed controller on it, um, you know, to basically slow the fan right down so that it's, it's in continuous operation, even through, through viewing. Uh, obviously, you put it on fast for your cool time. Um, you know, before you even start observing, just put the fan on and turn the power up and just leave it for however long it takes to cool your mirrors down. But the second reason, and one of the things that I designed into these, is this plate is actually just about the same diameter as this ring. So that when we take this fan system, and I'm just going to step into the camera and fit it. You can see now that it actually baffles that area where the light was getting in and I'm sure you don't need me to sort of you know put the camera at the front again and shine the torch in just take my word for it that does cure it and it, it cures it 100% so you could you know if you, you can either sort of contact me to try and get hold of one of these or have a go at making one yourself or you can even use a blank plate just get some black acrylic uh, and, and just sort out the diameters for the particular end cell of, of your Newtonian uh, and, and just fit that over the top. Um, Skywatcher used to put a black plate over the end of the telescopes in the older models. They stopped doing that quite some time ago and it's quite possible that you know that, that 
was the reason why they put them on there and I think the reason why they stopped is basically because it, it slows down cooling time and also you couldn't collimate without having to remove this plate and I think it was just a bit of a bind so it's just something to bear in mind that and like I said it's, it's one of those mysteries that could well be solved if, you, if you've been getting unusual reflections or uh, stuff in your, in your images that you, that you don't think that should be there uh, and that's it for that one Right, as you can see, I've actually now got the spider uh, back in position again. And I used uh, this little tool, which we actually introduced in uh, a previous video. If you look through my other YouTube videos for the uh, Newtonian collimation videos in part one, it actually explains what this is and how to use it to actually center your spider within your telescope. Now, also in that video, um, the same that I'm gonna repeat here, is that I'm actually introducing uh, the stainless steel washer which has three indentations in it that actually match up with the collimation bolts in the spider itself um, and it just makes everything a little bit smoother and I also introduce a Teflon washer that I made out of a, a piece of sheet Teflon and also I'm replacing the existing Skywatcher bolts uh, the collimation bolts with a new stainless steel centre bolt and also uh, stainless steel grub screws like so. Uh, let's just put those off to one side. Now also throughout the video I kept um, sort of reiterating you've got to be careful when you're handling your mirrors and everything and you know if you if you follow this video and you, you sort of make a mistake or break something I ain't paying for it. Um, so, you know, it's entirely at your own risk how far you go with your modding. Uh, but just to sort of, you know, reinforce the fact that I did keep reiterating that, what's the worst that can happen is possibly this. And yes, I'm absolutely gutted. Um, the worst part of it is I actually don't know exactly how it happened. Um, you know, I. I it was on the table at the side of where I was working on the tube. Nothing's been dropped on it. The mirror wasn't dropped. The only thing that I can assume is that with the scope and the tubes, while I was flocking or, or something, I've rolled the tube over and it's, and it's clipped that, that mirror. Um, so a, a really good piece of advice here is if you're working on a, on a surface, if you've got your mirrors anywhere, then obviously just put them on a different surface, well away and completely safe. Um, obviously I've kicked myself an hell of a lot of times and um, I've even bent over and had my wife kicked me a few times as well and it, it, it doesn't make me feel any better and I am absolutely gutted about it. Um, I've been in touch with Skywatcher and I've been in touch with OVL, the um, UK importers for the Skywatcher scopes and I've now got a replacement one on order which, you know, okay, we'll, we'll see what the sort of measure is because you can only measure a company by how well they handle stuff when things go wrong. So we will actually come back and follow up in this video when that new mirror arrives and we'll actually do uh, a precision centering of the mirror under the focuser using a webcam and a couple of pieces of software. Uh, so what I'm going to do next is I'm just going to fit that broken mirror um, and, and use the telescope for the time being. Uh, and just hope for the best and we will follow up as I say when, when the new mirror arrives. And that's about it for this one, it is a long one. Um, like I say, just watch out for the, for the part two. Um, what I will do is once I've got the mirror in, even though it's broken, we will have another look down the tube and flick back to how it was when we started and you'll just be able to see the, the, the difference in the sort of level of darkness within the tube and everything. And that'll be about it for this one. So what we'll do is just give you a look at it once I've got this, this mirror in place. Right, we've now got the secondary in there. And yes, it is a little bit hard to spot, but I'm sure you, you'll agree now that, you know, looking down the tube when we first started and looking down it now, it's definitely a lot darker in there and, and the reflective surfaces have certainly been cut down. Uh, you can also go to the extreme once you've got everything back together again, get your international paint, blackboard paint and just put a dab of it on each one of the, the, the bolts that are sticking through the tube, you know, that fix your finder and fix your focuser. Um, you know, if you just want to go to extremes and it's, you know, it's not a major big deal to, to sort of do it anyway. Um, and what we'll do is just move the scope round a little bit to give you a better view down there. And you can see that the 
the secondary mirror is what we call stealth and it's actually lovely and dark in that tube now um, in fact there we go if you go at a slight angle now there's just there's just nothing but blackness um, so like I said we'll we'll sort of show you uh, go back now to a still of what it was like before and compare the two and then that's it and um, like I said we will follow up with the part two once I've got a new secondary mirror and that's it for this one I know it's been an epic uh, but I hope you've enjoyed it and once again thanks for watching